Hello everyone, in this video we're going to take a look at what happens when you place a conducting sphere in a uniform electric field. We're going to find the new electric field that results when you do this, and we're also going to find the distribution of surface charge that is induced on the conductor. Now to start with, let's just imagine we've got two parallel plates, which we've charged um, by equal and opposite amounts. Let's say the plate at the bottom here has gained a positive charge, and the plate at the top has acquired a negative charge. And what this is, it's just a way of, um, one particular way in which we could produce an approximately uniform electric field, right? So if we do this, uh, we'll get some field lines that go purely vertically um, and kind of equally spaced between those plates from the positive one to the negative one. Okay, so let's denote this uniform electric field by E0, which is a vector. And if we define the vertical direction in this diagram to be the Z direction, then we can equivalently write that as the magnitude E0 times the Z hat vector. Okay, so what then happens if we put a conducting sphere in? Well, let's draw that. Let's put this sphere um, exactly at the midpoint um, of the two parallel plates. So a conducting sphere, now it could be a hollow sphere, um, so just like a, a spherical shell, or it could be a, a completely solid kind of ball of, of metal. Uh, you would get the same result uh, either way. Um, now, let's think about intuitively what we'd expect to happen. So because the electrons in this conductor are free to move around, you would expect a buildup of negative charge near the bottom, right? Because the electrons are going to be attracted towards the, um, the positive plate. And because overall the sphere has to be neutral, um, you would be left behind with an excess of positive charge um, at the top of the sphere, like that. Okay, and so you get this, intuitively you'd expect to get this charge separation, and that's kind of like a, a dipole, right? Because a dipole is just uh, two oppositely signed charges that have been slightly displaced from each other. Okay, so based on that idea, what we're going to do is actually start this off, not by thinking about a conducting sphere, but by thinking about a dipole. And then we're going to show that a dipole is actually equivalent to a conducting sphere in this particular um, scenario, right? So what I'm going to do is say the origin of the coordinate system is going to be exactly in the center there. And let's consider what happens if we place a dipole moment defined by, sorry, a dipole um, whose dipole moment is given by a vector P like that. If we place that at the origin in this uniform electric field, um, what is going to happen? So what we can do is use the principle of superposition to add together the potential associated with the dipole um, and the potential associated with the uniform field, right? So let's first write down the potential associated with a dipole. Now this is a standard result. Um, if you want to see where it comes from, I do have another video on that. But the, the potential of a dipole is P cos theta divided by uh, 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, where p is the dipole moment, and um, theta and r are just the, the standard um, spherical polar coordinates, right? What about the potential associated with the uniform field? So let's denote that as just v subscript uniform. Now, we know that, um, well, this electric field E0, that is supposed to be given by minus the gradient of this potential v uniform. Right, by definition of what the electric potential actually is. And so um, I guess by inspection of that, um, that fact, we can spot that the potential associated with the field is, has to be minus uh, E naught times the Z coordinate. Right? To convince yourself of that, just try taking the gradient um, of that uh, potential and you'll, you'll recover um, E naught times the Z hat vector. Um, now, because the dipole potential is most naturally expressed in spherical polar coordinates, let's also transform this z into spherical polar coordinates. Now, this is a standard transformation. Uh, z is equal to r cos theta, right, if we're converting from Cartesians to um, polars. So we can write that as minus e naught times r uh, cos theta. Right, so by the principle of superposition, if we want to know what happens if we actually place this dipole in a uniform electric field, uh, we can just add those two contributions together, right? So we find that the total potential, let's call it V tot, um, is just going to be P cos theta over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. And we've got to subtract off this uh, E naught R cos theta. 
And what we can also do is factorize out a cos theta, right? Uh, both terms are proportional to that same angular um, angular term cos theta. So we get p over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared minus e naught r um, all multiplied by cos theta. So the interesting thing about this is that the angular and radial parts of the potential have kind of they've completely decoupled from each other, right? So this bracketed term only depends on radius, and this cos theta only depends on um, the angular part, uh, well the angular coordinate, sorry, um, theta. And so notice that um, there is a specific surface along which uh, or over which this bracketed term is zero. Um, and therefore the potential overall is zero. So let's think about the implications of that, right? We can say that the um, potential is zero um, if p over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared is equal to uh, e naught r, right? Because then the bracket term is going to be zero. Um, if we just rearrange that to make r the subject, right? So multiply up by r squared, uh, divide by e naught and take the cube root, we find that this um, the particular radius at which the uh, potential is zero is given by um, p over 4 pi epsilon naught e naught um, all to the power of one third. And this defines a spherical surface, right? Because it's just a surface of constant radius. So what we're saying is if you put a dipole in a uniform electric field, there exists a particular um, spherical surface which is an equipotential surface, right? Because the potential takes the same value, zero, everywhere on that surface. So what we can do then is invoke the uniqueness theorem, um, which is another topic I have a, another video about, if you want to uh, learn a bit more about that, where we're going to invoke the uniqueness theorem and say that, well, a conductor has to be an equipotential surface always, right? Um, the idea with that is if it wasn't an equipotential surface, um, then you would have this kind of constant um, motion of electrons along the surface, right? So the electrons would just move along the surface until they they'd kind of reach the distribution um, that ensures no further motion. Okay, so the because the electrons are free to move in a conductor, um, they always kind of redistribute themselves until they stop moving. Um, along the surface. So the surface of conductor is an equipotential, which means we're actually free to place a conductor at this particular radius, spherical conductor at this particular radius, um, because that doesn't change the boundary conditions because it's already an equipotential surface, right? And so we have this idea of an equivalent between, let's say, a um, conducting uh, sphere, let's say the radius of this conducting sphere is going to be A, it's equivalent to like the field you would get outside that sphere is equivalent to what you would get by putting a, a dipole at the center of the coordinate system whose dipole moment is defined by that equation there, right? So this is equivalent to um, a dipole uh, with P equal to 4 pi epsilon naught A cubed E naught, right, which has just come from rearranging that equation uh, to make P the subject. Okay, so we're just, we're appealing to the uniqueness theorem and saying that in either case, you end up forcing there to be an equipotential surface um, at, a, at a particular radius. Um, and so from the uniqueness theorem, the electric field outside that radius has to be the same in either case. Okay, so one thing to notice about this is that the dipole moment that is equivalent to what you get with the sphere is proportional to E naught, right? So if you make the um, the applied uniform electric field bigger, the, uh, the effective or induced dipole moment P just increases in proportion to that electric field. And we usually define um, all of that stuff, 4 pi epsilon naught A cubed, to be a single coefficient, which we call the polarizability. Okay, so usually written as alpha. That's the same as alpha E naught. Um, okay, so what we can then do is go back to our expression at the top here for the total potential. And instead of writing this in terms of P, the dipole moment, we write it in terms of the radius of the equivalent conducting sphere, right? So what we get is uh, the total potential is going to be well, this first term in the brackets here 
p over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, um, we can rewrite that in terms of the radius a using that equation for the dipole moment. Um, and that turns out to be the same as, um, what's it going to be? It's going to be a cubed e naught over r squared. And the second term is still just um, e naught r, right? So then we get this, this cos theta, which is still there. Um, so we may as well also factor out uh, an e naught, right? So we can write that as a cubed over r squared minus r times e naught cos theta. Okay, uh, if we want the electric field, then we can just take the gradient of that and put a minus sign in front of it. And so the resulting electric field is going to be minus grad of V tot. Um, in spherical polar coordinates, um, this gradient is going to be equal to minus uh, dV by dr times, well, in the, in the r hat direction. And then the angular part is going to be 1 over r uh, dV by d theta in the theta hat direction. Okay, so if we go through, do that differentiation to find um, the electric field vector, um, what do we get? Well, the first part we're differentiating with respect to r, and so this a cubed over r squared is going to become a minus 2a cubed over r cubed, but then we've got this additional minus sign in the front, right? So that ends up being just um, 2a cubed over r cubed. Second term, uh, becomes minus one, but again, uh, we, we've got an extra minus sign, and so that's going to be a plus one. Um, and then we've got our e naught cos theta, and that's in the r hat direction. Um, for this second term, well, the bracketed term stays as it is, but we divide the whole thing by r, right? And so we add on um, a cubed over r cubed uh, minus one this time. Um, if we differentiate the angular part, we get minus e naught sine theta, but again, there's a minus sign, and so overall, we just get a, a positive e naught sine theta like that, and that is in the theta hat direction. So they, there you go. That's that's our expression for the um, the overall electric field that you would get um, by putting this this spherical conductor into the uniform electric field. One other thing we can do is find the induced charge distribution, and we're going to get that by considering the uh, electric field just at the surface, um, like just exterior to the surface of the conductor, right? So if, you go, if you're very close to the conductor, you can say the radius is roughly equal to A, right? So R is, is basically equal to A. And so if we see what happens when we do that, if we set R equal to A, well, this second term disappears because A cubed over R cubed would be the same as one. And so that just goes to zero. Um, the first term, uh, would become, we're going to get, well, again, a cubed over r cubed is 1, so you've got 2 plus 1 in the brackets, which is 3. So that is 3 e naught cos theta uh, times r hat. Notice, by the way, that it's purely radial, um, which it should be, right, because an electric field um, in electrostatics always has to be perpendicular to the surface of a conductor um, because the surface is an equipotential. Um, so that's the electric field. Now, there's a way, a very simple way to convert that into a charge distribution, um, which involves using Gauss's law and drawing a little imaginary box um, around the, the surface of the conductor. And there's this general result that uh, the electric field close to the surface of a conductor um, is given by just the charge density, surface charge density sigma uh, divided by epsilon naught like that. Okay, if you haven't seen that and you want me to um, do a video on where that comes from, just let me know in the comments. For now, we're just going to take that as a given and use that just to uh, say that the surface charge density uh, sigma is just going to be 3 epsilon naught e naught um, cos theta, right? So you get this um, charge density induced, which is proportional to cos theta. All right, so there you go. One final point to note is this only applies exterior to the um, to the to the conducting surface. Inside the conductor, whether it's a shell or whether it's a solid uh, ball of conducting material, the field is zero 
um, everywhere. Okay, uh, this is kind of related to the idea of a, a Faraday cage. If you apply an electric field to a conductor, that you always get a, a zero field inside. Um, anyway, uh, I think this is a quite a nice, uh, neat example of uh, using the new uniqueness theorem um, and kind of bringing together two seemingly unrelated problems of a, a dipole in an electric field and a, a sphere in an electric field.